everyone, it's Pacific, here with the fourth and final part of SCP-1730. If you haven't heard parts one through three, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to them now as this is a chronological story and this is the final part. However, next week we will be back to our regularly scheduled anthology content, um, and in fact next week's episode is something entirely different, so I think you'll enjoy it quite a lot. Second, uh, shortly after posting this on May 6th, it is the birthday of our incredible and lovely composer, Tom Rory Parsons. Uh, If you don't know, Tom makes an original score every single week for every single episode. Uh, He works incredibly hard, and uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Tom for a few years now, um, and have never met anyone quite like him. So... If you're on Twitter or on Facebook or uh, on our Discord, uh, pop in and wish Tom a very happy birthday. On Twitter, he is at ttom19. Join me in wishing him a very happy birthday. And last but certainly not least, the best way to support the show is by visiting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash scp underscore pod. But without further ado, SCP-1730 Part 4 Warning. The Foundation database is classified. Unauthorized access will result in detainment. Within this archive, you'll find the procedures, descriptions, and accounts of the most notorious anomalies we've encountered to date. Secure. Contain. Protect. Recovery Log 2. Recovery Team. Codename Simsera. Exploration Teams. Codename Game Wardens and Mole Rats. Assignment Personnel Recovery. Leads T5 Aranu, Z9 Hollis, and AP3 Ross. Note The following is an audio log of the extraction and recovery mission carried out by the members of Mobile Task Force Tau 5, Simsera. After having made contact with surviving members of MTF Apollo 3 and MTF Zeta 9, aside from the members of the mobile task forces, the team was tasked with recovering 27 surviving members of Site 13 staff, including Dr. Muhammad Scott, a Site 13 Assistant Director of Temporal Studies. Several of these individuals had sustained significant injuries, further increasing the difficulty of extraction efforts. Members of Mobile Task Force Alpha 20, Holy Divers, were stationed above ground and were prepared to move in to aid in extraction efforts once the recovery team had escaped the lower levels of the site. Mike's on. Are we really worried about recording all of this? Hey, Vigo. Shut the fuck up. Do what he says. Your lead, Power Ranger. Thank you. Onru has prepared an evacuation plan. I will let her explain it. Our travel paths from this position are compromised by the entity in the data center and the creature in the atrium. After speaking with Dr. Scott and his team, we have devised a route that leads us as far away from the current major threats as possible. Unfortunately, our information on all threats is incomplete. Even Dr. Scott was not privy to information on all containment entities within the site. As such, we should still proceed with extreme caution. This is likely already well understood. Yeah. Just a bit. All right, so what's the route we're taking? Our entry routes are here and here. The largest obstacles we are experiencing currently are the spatial instabilities within the lower levels of the site. On the suggestion of Dr. Scott and Captain Hollis, our route will first travel to this section of the facility where the Thresher device is contained. This device is the cause of the... instabilities. And while it is not possible to completely disable the device without risking our own lives or the lives of above-ground personnel... We should be able to reduce power to the device long enough for us to create a stable path to the surface, following this route here. I got lost once shortly after our insertion and ended up in that room. I was attacked by a number of creatures that were difficult to perceive, likely due to some latent anti-memetic effects. I was able to escape them, but they're no doubt still there. That machine draws a frankly impossible amount of energy from some energy source elsewhere in the site, and those creatures I saw feed off of it. So, there's that. Why don't we send a team ahead to disable the machine, then meet up with them before heading up? We will not have enough time, and the probability of our success drops dramatically if we split up our team. 
Once the device is powered down, it is likely that we will have less than an hour to make our escape before it trips its failsafes and powers back up again. We will just have to make our push from there, hoping that it buys us enough time. Alright, cool. Your assignments are as follows. Tau-5 will take point. Apollo-3 will take the right and left flanks, and Zeta-9 will take up the rear. The healthiest survivors will stay near the back, and those with more serious injuries will be near the front near Tau-5. In the event that we are flanked or assaulted, follow typical multi-force defensive assignments while allowing Tau-5 to intercept the higher threats. Maintain clear lines of communication. Tau-5 and the task force captains have channel priority. Keep all chatter to the minimum. You will all have plenty of time to speak once we reach the surface. Our priority now is extracting these people and staying alive. Unless you're in samsara, in which case I guess you guys are free to do what you want, but for the rest of us mortals, it doesn't help us to let the Power Rangers get mulched, since we're likely shit out of luck if they go belly up. Agreed. Does everyone understand our mission? Agreed. We're in. Acceptable. I will take point. We need to move quickly. Gather your things, prepare the civilians, and we will leave shortly. Teams break to assemble in their formation. Civilian survivors are briefed on the mission plan and positioned in the middle of the block. Shit. Irantu, we need to roll. Agreed. Let's move out. Munru, Nanku, collapse the main door. We will exit expediently out the side. Gladly. The block moves out of a side door towards a side hallway. T5 Nanku and Munru hang back and set explosive charges around the door frame. Leeches are beginning to work their way under the door frame and through the cracks in the walls. As they step away from the door, Nanku opens their flamethrower on the leeches. I cannot say that you're making a difference, Nanku. There's likely many more leeches elsewhere. This is very satisfying to me. Munru and Nanku move quickly to join the rest of the group, which has begun moving down the side hallway. As they pass through the first door, there's an explosion, and the building around them shakes. From beneath the group, a loud, uncanny screaming sound is heard. Think they know we're moving? Undoubtedly. My optics are pinging. Strange. Move everyone back. I'll scout ahead. T5 Munru comes around the corner of the hallway, weapon drawn. Their scramble optical implant highlights a dangerous meme on the wall. At the far end of the hallway, a vaguely humanoid entity, the same as seen during the previous remote drone exploration of SCP-1730, is seen drawing on the wall with a long, curved finger. Munru projects an image of the entity to Nanku, who rounds the corner behind Munru. Hold. Suddenly, the entity turns towards Munru and Nanku, and opens a single wide eye, which is immediately processed and blocked by scramble units. The entity begins to move very quickly down the hallway, changing dramatically as it moves. The entity becomes considerably larger, and its long rope flares out to either side, exposing additional hazards that are blocked by the scramble units. Munro and Nanku raise their weapons and fire. The creature reels backwards as it is struck by bullets, with large holes opening across its flesh. Munru reloads, and loads incendiary rounds and fires. As it staggers backwards, the entity begins to scratch madly against the wall to the right, seemingly attempting to dig through the wall, away from the gunfire. Nanku takes one more shot, striking the entity in its eye, and causing it to collapse on the ground. Is everything alright? It appears so weak. Suddenly, the hallway shakes violently. The floor beneath the collapsed humanoid entity crumbles and falls away revealing a large hole beneath the floor. Within the hole is a long, slick, black creature, covered in blood-red eyes, with a mouth full of many rows of long, sharp teeth. As it bursts through the floor, a cascade of small leeches are propelled into the hallway. The humanoid entity slips through the destroyed floor and falls into the mouth of the large creature, which lets out a large scream as it devours the entity. Long, wet appendages snake into the hallway, as Nanku and Munru begin to retreat. Nanku ignites their flamethrower again, warding off the approaching smaller leeches. What's going on? We will need to find a different route, quickly. Follow me. 
The group moves past the collapsed hallway as Munro and Nanku provide cover fire. They pass through a custodial dormitory and exit into a maintenance area behind it. Over there. We can take this path towards the machine. We're right behind you, but I'm beginning to think this creature is far larger than we anticipated. Onru, take the point. We will move now. T moves down the long maintenance hallway. The hallway curves to the left, opening into a larger space full of loading equipment and machines. Several large loading docks are visible in the back of the room, although each one is collapsed and destroyed. You're on to the walls in here are seeping. We can't stay here long. One moment. Munru, Nanku, how far back are you? Munru, Nanku, please report. I ran to. Nanku is damaged. We are not able to rendezvous with you immediately. Onru, do keep us updated on your position, and I will let you know when we can regroup. Understood. The group moves to the far end of the maintenance warehouse exiting through a pair of doors leading into a staff break room. Black fluid seeps through the walls. The group has to stop briefly to bandage up the survivor, whose wound had begun bleeding again. A loud screeching sound is heard nearby, and the group begins moving again. They enter into another hallway, leading in the direction of the Thresher Wing. As they move through the hole, Anru hears a distant sound. Irantu, wings. How many? Many. More than I can count. They are very small, but there is a great multitude of them. You got anything else useful, Power Girl? A tinkling sound, like crystal on crystal. Fuck. Crystal butterflies. It has to be that. We'll get shredded. Unlikely. The group moves towards the sound, which continues to grow louder until it becomes a cacophonous sound that seems to be right above them. God, where's that coming from? Steady now. Steady. I round you the vent. In front of them, a grate on the ceiling vent falls to the floor, and a cloud of sparkling crystal butterflies begin to fill the hallway. Irantu sees the butterflies and turns back to the group. Everybody down, please. As the group drops to the ground, Irantu runs towards the cloud of butterflies. They disappear briefly, and after a short moment, there's a burst of flames that arcs upwards into the vent, and the sound of shattering crystal can be heard above them. As the smoke clears, Irantu becomes visible again. The majority of their flesh has been shredded by the wings of the butterflies, and Irantu's entire body is scorched. Significant amounts of flesh hang loose from their body. The skin on their back is blackened and blistered, and a thick metal implement is now visible through the scorched flesh. Anru stands and approaches them. Are you able to continue? Of course. Jesus fucking Christ, man. Are you alright? Yes. Why wouldn't I be? The group moves through another hall, seeping with black fluid, and then another. But the third hallway is clean, and relatively untouched. They ascend a short staircase before coming to a stop before a thick vault door. The machine is behind this door. I came out this way, but the door's sealed behind me. I don't know how to unlock it. Dr. Scott, do you know how to open this door? No. I never had access to this chamber. I was hoping Munru would be here. I do not think I can open this door. Suddenly, there is a resounding click, and the door in front of them slowly opens. A monitor next to the door illuminates, and a dark room is visible on it. In the back of the room, hidden in shadows, an indistinct humanoid entity waves. (laughs) A harsh electronic static sound, vaguely reminiscent of laughter, can be heard through an unseen loudspeaker. The screen powers off. It's a pretty fucked up clown. Come, hurry. The group enters the chamber beyond. The room is very dark, with a multitude of dim, green lights visible on the walls of the room. Based on the luminescence of the lights, and the apparent distance of them from each other, the room appears to be several hundred meters in diameter. Near the back of the room, a tower of circling green lights is visible. Hey, Power Rangers. Can you see anything in here? You have dark vision or something, yeah? My visor is shot. Onru and I were forced to eject our implants after they were damaged by a powerful mimetic entity. My visor works. Hang on. All right. So there's uh, some kind of machine near the back of the room under those lights. I can't really make out any of it from here, but it's there. 
I don't sell shit. Yeah, I do. On the ceiling, there are... Fuck. There are a lot of those things. What are they? I honestly don't know. I can't make them out. They're definitely fucking with perception. I don't... I don't think they've seen us. Seriously, though, there might be 500 of those things. That would be more than Anru and myself can deal with. We need to make a decision. Either attempt to disable the machine without attracting their attention, or find a way to dispatch the creatures. I am, of course, willing to accept ideas. I mean, we could blow them up. Houston has explosives. Let's allow them to try and get all at once, though. Maybe, but it's more likely that... Suddenly, there is a massive disturbance beneath the chamber. To the left of the group, roughly 100 meters away, there is an explosion and the wall falls away. From within the wall emerges a long, slick appendage covered in red eyes. The eyes all open at once. Fuck. There is a screeching sound, and from above them, many hundreds of short, imperceptible entities fall from the ceiling. The entity in the wall begins to lash out at the smaller entities, attempting to pull them in towards a mouth that has appeared on its front. The creatures fly towards the larger creature and begin to tear at it with their claws, though many of them are shoveled into the open mouth of the creature. Hmm. It works as well. Onru, get to the machine. The rest of you, get back to the hallway. We will not have much time. The group retreats into the hallway outside of the large room. Anru sprints across the chamber as more and more of the smaller entities fall from the ceiling and attack the large creature. Several of them begin to move towards Anru, only to be dispatched by weapon fire from Irantu. As Anru reaches the manual control panels of the machine, they input the information provided to them by members of Dr. Scott's team. Lights around the room illuminate, exposing an enormous, vastly complicated machine that encompasses the entire back wall of the room. More and more of the hostile entities peel off towards Anru, who pauses to open fire on those who have come too close. From beneath the room, there's another disturbance, and the floor in the middle of the room falls away. Another large entity emerges from the hole in the floor, and long tendrils snake out towards Anru. From behind, Irantu comes gunfire, as the entire AP-3 team has emerged from the door and begun firing at the entity. The creature recoils, viscous fluid spilling from the gunshot wounds. The tendrils whip around them, gripping AP-3 Vigo and tossing them into the air. Vigo strikes the wall and their body falls to the ground, where the first large entity grabs it with a tendril and pulls it into their mouth. Suddenly, small leeches begin to pour from the hole in the floor and move quickly towards Irantu and Houston, who open fire on the leeches as Ross moves to pull Irantu away from the hole. As they do, Ross tosses an incendiary grenade into the hole and pulls Irantu to the ground. There is an explosion, and flame erupts around the large entity, which rears back and flails before collapsing into the hole. From deep below them, the group can hear a very loud screaming sound, and suddenly, the entire room begins shaking. The other large entity retracts into its hole, collapsing the wall behind it as it does. The remaining small creatures from the ceiling are dispatched by AP-3 and Z-9 teams. As they do, the room begins to shake more violently. Several lights affixed to the machine in the back begin to flash and then dim. Fuck! God damn it, Vigo! Fuck! The loss of Vigo is disappointing. I'm sorry. We do not have a substantial amount of time to grieve. We must keep moving. Anru, Ross, Houston, and Irantu leave the chamber. More rumbling is felt beneath them, and occasional loud screeches punctuate the machine noise from this section of the facility. They reach the stairwell, and Houston throws the doors open. Whoa, fuck. What? What is the matter? There's nothing here. The door just opens up into nothing. It's just dark, as far down as I can see. It is likely that disabling the Thresher device has altered our previous escape route. We will need to devise another path to the surface. Yes. One moment. Monroe, where are you? Difficult to say, unfortunately. Have you powered down the machine? We just did. Fine timing, then. We were being pursued by a creature. Then suddenly there was a wall where the creature had been. The local topography appears to have reset itself. 
Stay in one place. We will come to find you. Our escape begins now. Fantastic. The main group leaves the empty stairwell and turns back down towards the hallway they came from. Passing by the Thresher Access hallway again, they turn and begin to climb another staircase. As they reach the top, I ran two pauses. The hallway in front of them is flooded by ankle-high water. As they begin to move slowly through the water, one of the researchers behind them screams. What is it? Bodies. Look. Just below the surface of the water, pale human corpses are visible, appearing to be floating roughly half a meter down. Do not attempt to look at them. You do not recognize them. Move quickly. Come on. The team hurries down the hallway, towards another set of doors. Where, written on the walls, are the words, What happened to Site 13? With the word, What, covered out by the word, Emerson, and the words, Have we become blasphemous, beneath that. The group proceeds without incident for a short while longer, slowly ascending as safe routes become available. After roughly eight minutes of travel, the group enters a large mechanical garage, where several pieces of large machinery sit in various states of repair. They pause to secure one of the injured survivors, while Henri attempts to devise a new route. Suddenly, a loud banging sound is heard, and a piece of machinery flies across the room, narrowly missing AP3 Ross. Whoa, fuck, where'd that come from? In the corner of the room, a stack of mechanical parts is seen moving, rising up and self-assembling into a quasi-humanoid entity. Attached to the top of the large mechanical construct is a small, crudely constructed toy robot. The entity begins to move towards them, and a voice is heard from an unknown source within the entity. <laughs> I am reborn to breathe devastation upon this fetid earth. Pitiful humans, you will feel the dark sting of my eternal torment. The small robot on top of the construct is seen waving its arms wildly. This is... annoying. Anru, get these people out. Ross, to me. I am the herald of your destruction. Embrace death. Irantu, Ross, and Houston open fire on the entity, to little effect. The entity lifts another large piece of equipment and throws it towards the group, missing them by a wide margin. Houston throws a frag grenade at the entity, which it catches in one of its outstretched hands and grips tightly. How dare you! I will tread upon you like- The grenade explodes, shattering the creature's hand and causing it to stagger sideways. Anru is seen sprinting towards the entity. As they approach it, Anru leaps into the air, sailing over the top of the entity in a tall arc. At the top of the arc, Anru reaches out a hand and grabs a small toy robot from on top of the construct, causing it to collapse. As Anru flips towards the ground, they toss the robot towards the wall. No! I am the Harbinger! I am... The toy robot strikes the wall and shatters. Rantu, is that you? We just heard something crashing. You must be near. Stay where you are. We are en route. The group moves out of the garage and towards a large atrium section. From around the corner comes Munru and Nanku. Munru appears to have sustained burns all over their lower body, but is otherwise undamaged. Nanku is missing the lower half of their jaw, and black fluid covers the front of their bodysuit. Nanku waves with their remaining hand as the group approaches. You look well. <laughs> well, admittedly, morale has increased in the group since Nanku found herself unable to talk. This is a cute reunion, but let's get back to this shit. How far are we from the entrance? This is a main atrium. If we follow this hallway here, it will lead towards a processing station. And past that, we should find access points to the surface. Exceptional. Let's get the lead out then, and- From below them, a very loud crashing sound is heard, alongside more screaming. The floor beneath the group again begins to buckle. Fuck, run! The group flees towards the hallway Munro had identified, but are stopped when the floor there also collapses. A plume of smoke erupts from the destroyed floor, and one researcher slips on the collapsing ground and slides into it. Anru leads the group away from the atrium, as the floor there has completely collapsed. Irantu stops to turn, and looks down inside the hole. 
Beneath the hole is an incredibly large chamber, appearing to have been dug through dozens of layers of subterranean floors. Within the chamber, there are many small lights around the outside, and at the bottom is a giant, massive, writhing mass, with several other large black masses extending out from it. As they're pulled away, Arantu sees red eyes opening across the entire mass of the creature, and hears more screaming. The group flees down the side hallway, but are pursued by long tendrils, snaking out of the hole. AP3 Ross and Houston open fire on the tendrils, halting them momentarily, but they are quickly replaced by more. Z9 Astoria is seen slipping on a patch of viscous fluid and falling, before being consumed by one of the ends of the tendrils. There are sounds of metal crushing and rock and concrete being grinded as the structure around the group begins to heave violently. Smaller leeches begin to pour out of the walls around them, and Nanku fires their flamethrower at them. The group rounds a corner and finds a dead end, and turning back are confronted with another tendril that has burst through a hole in the wall. Holy fuck, we're trapped. This is it. This is it. Holy fuck. Onru, we need a way out. I... I'm having difficulty. I... Wait. Wait. I have an idea. I think I know where we are. The group follows Hollis towards a descending stairwell and moves quickly down it. Hollis tosses an incendiary grenade towards the encroaching tendrils and slams the door shut behind them as it explodes. The screams from below intensify as they descend and the stairwell begins to shake. Holes in the stairwell open up as more leeches begin to pour out of them. All task force members open fire as long tendrils snake through the holes as well. Upon reaching the landing, Hollis motions the group into a doorway. Here, in here, go, go, go! The group enters the hallway and sprints towards the other end. As they do, they pass a sign on the wall that reads, Stairs to Cryogenics. Captain Hollis, what are you doing? You're gonna have to trust me here, Blue Ranger. I've been doing this a long time. I... <laughs> okay, I think this will work. The group exits the hallway into a large observation section, passing many large windows with blast protectors drawn across them. The team stops in front of one window, overlooking a massive chamber lined with huge steel doors. Overhead are the words, Olympia Class Testing Observation. Hollis, what do you have in mind? Call it a hunch. We need to get downstairs. Come on. The group runs towards the stairwell at the end of the room and quickly descends to the main level of this wing. As they exit onto the floor of the Olympia-class containment chamber, a wall behind them begins to buckle, and leeches pour out of it. Pink Ranger, that panel over there. You need to get that door open. Wh- what? I said open the goddamn door! Hurry! What the fuck are you waiting for? Go! T5 Anru runs towards the control panel, near one of the tall steel doors. The wall behind them continues to buckle. Monroe, that one. Get that one open too. Yes, absolutely. T5 Monroe attempts to access the door controls, while Z9 Hollis turns towards the group. Everyone else, listen to me. You civilians need to get to the far end of this room, as far as it goes. Just keep running. There's an access point to the power station above this part of the facility. You need to just keep climbing until you get there. Once you're there, you need to blow a wall. That'll get you out. But you need to hurry. Shit is about to pop off in a pretty major way down here. Ross, you and your boys just fire at anything that comes out of that wall. I'll tell you when we can go. Erantu, you stay with me. This is gonna get pretty messy. Understood. All right. Fucking go! Come on! The group flees down the main pathway towards the chamber, away from the buckling wall. As they do, the wall finally gives way, and a gargantuan, slick, black entity pours into the chamber. It is approximated to be at least 200 meters in height, covered with black tendrils and dark red eyes. When the creature sees the group, it opens its massive mouth, revealing rows of long, yellow teeth. In the center of the mouth, a naked human woman is visibly conjoined, in some way, to the prehensile tongue within the creature. As it opens its mouth, it lets out a piercing scream and begins to move towards the group. Every available task force member opens fire on the creature, emptying their remaining magazines and throwing every possible incendiary device towards it. The creature is slightly deterred, but for every place that is pierced by weapons fire, viscous fluid and leeches begin to pour from its body. Several long tendrils begin to snake towards the group. I have it. I have it, Captain Hollis. Come on then, girl. Throw the fucking thing. Anru steps away from the control panel and runs towards the group in the middle of the chamber. As a loud groaning is heard behind them, the rest of the team sees the huge metal doors begin to slide open. 
A thick cloud of ice-cold fog rolls out of the chamber, obscuring the interior from view. What's in there? Monroe, you got yours? Hang on. Yeah, I think that'll do. Suddenly, the door behind Monroe begins to glow brightly red. Then white, and then the center of it buckles and the door collapses. As Munro hurries away, a colossal, motionless, flaming humanoid entity floats out of the chamber. In its unmoving hands are a huge sword. As it exits the collapsed doorway, enormous flaming wings unfurl from its back. The large creature begins to scream, and its tendrils begin to lash out at this creature. As the tendrils come close, long streets of fire erupt from the sword towards them rupturing them and sending viscous fluid and scorched leeches flying across the room. The massive creature screams, and a dozen of other tendrils fly towards the flaming humanoid. As the two engage, there's another sound, like a long whining, and then suddenly, the room is silent. From within the cold, foggy room, a towering, vaguely servine creature steps out into the main chamber. It is composed of a body covered in light green and cream-colored hair, a long, thin neck ending in a hairless, somewhat humanoid face, and vast intertwined, wide and black antlers that pulse with streaks of blue light. Floating above its head are nine concentric rings of glowing, rotating crystals and metallic spheres. The creature slowly steps out of the containment cell and begins to look towards the team on the ground below. It opens its mouth with a long, droning sound. Around its body, several large metallic cylindrical structures appear, followed by a distinct cracking sound. It begins to step towards the team of task force members, but is struck from behind by three tendrils that wrap around its neck. The creature lets out another drone, and suddenly, the sound returns from the chamber as long streaks of fire arc across the space. The cylindrical construct turns lengthwise and speeds across the room towards the large black leech, striking it in the central mass. From all around the Servine entity, more and more metallic spheres appear and fly towards both the leech and the flaming humanoid, which in turn begin to attack one another. Fucking yes! Go get him, big guy! Time to fucking go, kids! Let's go! The team begins to sprint after the group of civilians towards the far wall as jets of flame strike the ground around them. Nanku catches the end of a dismembered black tendril in their shoulder, throwing them off balance. Nanku falls to the ground, firing openly with her weapon as they're engulfed in fire. AP3 Houston pauses briefly to turn towards them, but is grabbed by Arantu. We do not have time. As the soldiers near the group of survivors, all of whom who have huddled near an exit door at the end of the chamber, there is a crashing sound and they turned to see the Servine entity standing up from where it had been thrown across the room. The leech creature whips at it, as more metallic spheres appear and arc back towards it. There's an eruption of fire as the flaming humanoid is struck by another several tendrils, which try to pull the humanoid towards the mouth of the leech creature. The team reaches the survivors and quickly exits through the door. The group begins to quickly ascend the staircase within. All right. Just like I said, up. We need to go up. Over. A long, thin metallic cylinder crashes through the wall of the stairwell, narrowly missing one of the researchers and Dr. Scott. A second cylinder comes through the wall, striking Arantu and obliterating them as it contacts the wall behind them. As the group continues to ascend, fire fills the stairwell below them, and another long, loud droning sound can be heard. Followed by silence and then followed by a thick bursting sound that shakes the entire facility. The group reaches a landing and begins to move towards another staircase at the end of the hallway. Z9 Hollis hangs behind. What are you doing? Giving you some more time. And something else, I think. Get these people out of here. Go! I can stay behind, Hollis. Your life is finite. Yeah, yeah, I get the spiel, Power Ranger, but right now you need to get these people out of here. Let me go do my thing, all right? I'll catch up with you later. I understand. Good looking out, Hollis. (laughs) You almost sounded like a person there for a second, Monroe. Hollis runs away from the group. Monroe catches up to the rest of the group, who reach another staircase and begin to ascend. For the next ten minutes, the group continues to ascend through the facility several times narrowly avoiding debris and falling rubble as the lower levels of the site begin to collapse. 
The sound of the entities below continue to be heard, and several times the creatures become visible through large gaps in the walls or floor. At one point, AP3 Ross catches sight of the unmoving flaming humanoid, nearly completely covered in metal, as long streaks of fire burst through the open scenes of the encasement. Shortly afterwards, there's a two minute break in all video footage, followed by a shot of the head of the servine creature smashing through a wall in front of the group. As they turn to run away from it, the head turns towards them, and two researchers are instantly transmuted into hexagonal columns of an unknown yellow-green material. After a short time, AP3 Ross picks up a signal from Site Command. Team lead, this is Site Command. Do you read us? Holy fuck, yes. Yeah, I do. Do you hear me? We do. You have appeared on our geolocating systems, Ross. You're not far from the exit. Where is Captain Hollis and Irantu? Irantu is dead. Hollis... She ran off a while back. We haven't seen her since then. Understood. What about the rest? We've suffered some casualties. Fuck! We lost a few of the civilians, and Vigo, and a few others. It's really bad in here right now, Command. We're going to need all the help we can get. We... Munru. Where's Anru? She... Oh. She was behind us. Where is she? Don't worry about that now. We're marking an extraction point on your visor. The extraction team is waiting for you there. We're going to get you all out. The group hurries towards the extraction point as the site continues to collapse around them. Above ground, aerial surveillance captures footage of large sections of the site sliding into the ground and smoke beginning to bellow from the power station and nearby mechanical facilities. Jets of flame become visible as the earth beneath SCP-1730 begins to give way. Mobile Task Force Alpha-20, Holy Divers, enters the site near the crumbling power station. The group of survivors comes into view and are immediately moved towards the access point, and then away from the site by members of MTF-A-20. As the rest of the task force members are pulled away from the site, a separate transmission reaches site command, originating from T-5 on route. Anru and Hollis are standing in front of the Thresher device, which roars with activity behind them. They are firing their weapons at an encroaching black mass in front of them, which is punctuated by streaks of fire. In the background, the Servine entity can be seen tearing through long tendrils with its antlers, as rods of flaming metal streak across the room towards the leech-like entity. Hollis turns towards the cameras visibly laughing, firing their weapon openly. Hollis has removed their helmet. The hum of the machine behind them grows noticeably louder, eventually overtaking all sounds in the room. Streaks of electricity arc across the ceiling above them. Hollis smiles and turns towards Anru, who looks down to find their torso has been destroyed by a jet of flames. As Anru slumps to the side, the last shot is of Hollis, laughing hysterically and wildly firing her weapons, as the enormous machine behind them begins to glow bright white. There is a flash, and the transmission ends. Outside, as MTF A20 continues to move researchers and personnel to safety, there's a deafening crackling sound, and a large hum fills the air. The area around the site begins to visibly distort, as if being seen through water. And then, suddenly, SCP-1730 is gone. In its place is an immense crater over one kilometer in diameter. No other transmissions are received from within the site, and no other anomalous activity is detected. Hey everyone, it's Pacific here with a quick ad break. And a reminder, if you hate ads and you'd rather listen uninterrupted, consider supporting us at patreon.com slash scp underscore pod. And now, back to our show. So this week, I want to do the uh, final list of credits, and then we are all caught up. Uh, in April, we had almost 80 new patrons, which is absolutely astounding. So uh, please bear with me as I go through this very long list. Actually, the longest list of new patrons we have ever had ever had. Uh, thank you for making April such an amazing month. Uh, and those things go to Regina Ashfield, Yelarius, Stephanie M. Segovia, Katrina Sampson, Ash Marriott, Ty Guerin, Taylor Munich, Sebastian Alea, 
Kai Devlin, Danielle Fell, Larry Gardner, Full Metal Parka, Slacker Savior, Kyle M., Daniel Ford, Dalton Smith, Matt Berkey, David McMurray, Scott Campbell, Dr. Maxwell, Larry, Mark Bryars, Saul Curtis, Conrad Thodes, Tommy Martin, Khalil Demachki, IJP the Great, Chaos M345, Joe Simmons, Lauren Byer, Jennifer Parsons, Daz Was Me, Corey DeWint, Tom Godiska, Richard Wadsworth, The Immortal Orange, Kitty Saurus Rex, Darkest Light 115, Nick Juliana, Brandon Furia, Spareto 579, Humble Fishmonger, Teo, Brian Shell, Greg McElroy, Rachel Lucas, Ryan Evans, Mietti Spaghetti, JD Ford, Cillian Wisdom, Christopher Hooper, Kate K, Libby, Jonathan Ackerson, Bare Hands, Ah, Zachary Williams, Patry, Thomas Hansuch, Frank Mayberry, Anthony Leonard, Kiro, Postcard Mixtapes, Aaron L, Austin Angus, Anthony Lenovo, Caitlin Kernow, Hannah Mullen, Missiel Perez, Raider Scaver, Forever and Wonder, Zachary Wolf, Megan O'Connor, NG Stowaway, and Tim Carew. Thanks a bunch, guys. I cannot believe we've hit 500 patrons. That is mind boggling, and it's all thanks to you. So, thank you. SCP 1730 was written by DJ Cactus. Our host and narrator is John Grills. AP3 Ross was Jesse Hall. AP3 Vigo was Daisy McNamara. AP3 Houston was Jack Burford. Z9 Hollis was Hannah Mullen. T5 Irontu was Atticus Jackson. T5 Onru was Nicole Goodnight. T5 Munru was David Collins. T5 Nanku was Addison Peacock. Dr. Scott was Alvin Bowling II. Site Command was Fletcher Armstrong. Mechanical Entity was Dana Creaseman. And additional narration was done by me, Pacific S. Obadiah. The new guy is Danny Sweet. Our script curator is Jesse Hall. And our music is done by the incredible Tom Rory Parsons. I'm your showrunner and sound designer, Pacific S. Obadiah. And our producers are Tom Owen and Brad Miska. For more information, visit scparchives.com. This is a bloody disgusting podcast.